to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Welcome to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and I'm here with Bill Schofield and John Harrigan. Howdy, guys. How are you? Anything new happening? Yeah, doing well, man. We're uh, in Cairo. Ramadan has started, and so it's an interesting dynamic in the Middle East, and uh, I've had a lot of really interesting, fruitful conversations. Um, Our uh, Muslims are kind of both on edge and more spiritually engaged during the season, so it's, Mm, uh, it's fun dynamics. Yeah, wow. Nice. How about you, Bill? I'm doing good, doing good here. Northern California is starting to heat up, so we're uh, wow. Yep, we're 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 getting there, but but things are generally good. Yeah, family's good. The community here is doing well. Lord's doing some cool things. Great to hear. Wow, great to hear. Well, listeners, thanks again for joining us this week for another episode of our show. Here on Season 2, we really wanted to interview folks from various walks of life that have taken this apocalyptic gospel, this good news focused on the return of Jesus and the day of the Lord, and hear how it's affected their lives. And so our heart in doing this is really to encourage you, to provoke you, to stir you to pour out your life for this gospel, to boldly proclaim it, because really that is the only appropriate response to the message, right? And so with that said, on our show today, we're honored to have a very special guest, Dick Brogdon, with us. Dick and his wife, Jennifer, are Assemblies of God world missionaries for 29 years, working in Mauritania, Kenya, Sudan, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia, and they're co-founders of the Live Dead Movement, which is a partnership to plant churches among unreached people groups through teams. And The thing that I love about this, Dick, you said you can't wait for Jesus to come back and you're living and longing for the day of the Lord. Well, Dick, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, guys. Honored to be with all of you. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Why don't you give our listeners a bit more about you, who you are, uh, maybe your family and what you do, and specifically, if you want to take a little bit of time to develop, why you put that bit about the return of Jesus in the bio that you sent us. Sure. So I was born in Kenya, East Africa. My mom and dad were missionaries. They went out in the 60s, and I grew up in the context of the gospel going forward to the regions beyond as being normal Christianity. I didn't know that anyone did anything different. And from a fourth-generation Pentecostal background, so we sang the songs of Zion in my living room. We talked about heaven all the time. There, you know, My mom grew up poor. She didn't have shoes until she was 15 years old. So the comforts of the world were not something that were a distraction for our family. We, we read a lot of Bible. We sang a lot about Jesus. And my mom and dad were pioneer church planters amongst the unreached. And so that's the soup that I grew up in. And from an early age, I always had a longing um, inculcated by my parents for the presence of Jesus and conscious of sin and longing for that unmitigated reality of being with him and that he really was the sweetest name of all. And so I'm thankful to the heritage my parents gave for for me as far as, you know, when, as soon as I could read, they had me read the Bible through. So I think from the age of six or so, I've been reading through the Bible every year, numerous times, um, very focused on the spirit and family altar time, very hospitable home. It was always inclusive. So my parents modeled for me. The sweetness of the presence of Jesus is not lived out by being a hermit. It is extended to those who have never experienced it. And so I was 16 years old and in boarding school, and I walked out of my dorm room and looked at the stars, saw the glory of God in the heavens, and was struck By that thought of Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. There's no language or speech where they have not been heard. And that little heart thought, you know what, Jesus, I want you to be glorified amongst the crown of your creation, all peoples everywhere. If you can be glorified in the stars, why not amongst people? And that's how I was called to missions, to call to be uh, making Jesus famous everywhere. Went to Bible school, began to pray for Muslims came to grips with the reality of 1.6 at that time, billion people or so 
going to a crisis eternity under the wrath of God without general information of what the problem was, let alone the cure. And so I, from an early age, to answer your question about why do I long for heaven, another boarding school experience, we would go to boarding school. I went to boarding school when I was young, seven years old. So we would do a three-year term, excuse me, a three-month term, and then go home for a month. At the end of that three months, I can remember sitting on the stone steps of my British boarding school, my eye on the corner of the road, waiting for my dad's white 504 Peugeot to, with a roof rack to come around the corner, just longing for the appearing of my father to take me home. School was great. We played sports. We played cricket and rugby. We had the Boy Scouts. I learned Latin from fourth grade on. There was drama. There was music. A lot of good things about school, but it wasn't home. And all my little heart could think of is I can't wait for dad to come around the corner and take me home. And that's a picture for me of how I live out my life here on this earth. Life here is great. I'm blessed. I'm in the top 1% of the world as far as wealth. I have a nice car. I have good food. I've traveled the world. I've done fun things. But you know what? This isn't my home. This isn't where I belong. And I cannot wait for the trumpet to sound and for the Lord to descend. And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I will be changed. And this mortal body will take on incorruption. And I will ever be in the presence of the Lord. I am sitting on the stairs of the school of life, and I cannot wait for my father to come for the Lord Jesus Christ to descend and to take me to my eternal home, which is robust, which is full of adventure, which is full of relationship, exploration, and I, I just can't wait for that day. I'm not saying life is bad. For me, it's pretty good. I know very little to date of the reality that many others suffer with. But even in the wonderful aspect of everything my life has been, it is completely dissatisfying because it's not home. I just can't wait to go home. That's awesome, Dick. I appreciate that. I, Benjamin just finished, uh, my oldest son just finished his second term at, uh, at RVA, that boarding school. And so he's loving it. It's a new world. That's awesome. And uh, for for listeners, just FYI, Dick is actually my boss. So I, I work <laughs> uh, I work with uh, Live Dead here in the Arab world, and I have uh, the utmost appreciation uh, for you, Dick, and your life and ministry. So, um, so my question would be kind of what happens a lot of times is that eschatology and the return of Jesus a lot of times gets downplayed in the missions movement. We we actually uh, interviewed Dalton Thomas, and he had a, a major evangelical leader like tell him that he needed to tone down talking about the return of Jesus. And, and, uh, and so that dynamic happens where it's like eschatology is, is viewed as some somehow detrimental to evangelism and missions. And so, and we would say the exact opposite, you know, that it actually amplifies it. But I don't know if you could kind of talk about that a little bit, just, you know, the dynamics between the return of Jesus and your calling in evangelism and missions and uh, how those work out in your own life and discipleship. Great question, John. And it's a delight to work with you. I might be your positional leader, but you're my theological leader. So I look to John for explanations of the scriptures and have been enriched by his life and ministry. Yeah, so to me, they're inseparable. And if we start theologically, even classic texts like Matthew 24, 14, which I'm sure you guys have unpacked to great depths, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to every nation, and then the end will come. That end that is coming, where we get to go home, where the Lord descends in glory, that's, the, that's what we're driving towards. And we don't get there, we don't get to go home until we have completed the commission of our Lord and Savior, which was that he would want disciples made and churches planted amongst all the ethnic, every unreached people group. So the assignment to go into all the world and make Jesus famous amongst all peoples is inextricably tied to the end, to the last day, to the day of judgment, to that great wrath of the Lord. My simple explanation of the gospel is this, that the love of God saves us from the wrath of God for the glory of God. 
and the atoning work of Jesus on the cross, which makes eternal life possible because of the resurrection, is all on this trajectory towards that great and glorious day when the Lord descends, the judgment of the living and the dead, which, let alone the scriptures, is in all the creeds of the ancient church. You know, he is coming to judge the living and the dead. There's a day of reckoning. We must be ready and we must be active because what is the only chronological kind of meter we have in the scriptures that lets us know how we're doing towards that great and glorious day is the gospel going to every unreached people group. So let's get on our horse. Let's get this thing done. Let's pull together in the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? So that the day of the Lord will come, so that the Lord descends in power and glory, so we enter into eternal life with all of its riches. So for me, John, to answer your question, that's what it's all about, is the day of the Lord. And that's the context of missions, and that is the fulfillment of it as well. Missions isn't a standalone commission. It is tied completely to the the biblical narrative that has this ultimate fulfillment when Christ comes in power and in glory. I see that not only theologically, I see it historically. Again, I reference I'm part of the Pentecostal movement, and if you look back at our origins— not only the holiness strains, but there was this sociological implication. Like, man, enlightenment, that didn't work. Industrial revolution just made us better at killing one another. We're just getting more educated and being wicked. This isn't working. The only solution is the day of the Lord. The only solution is when Jesus comes back. And yet here we are, backside of the tracks, you know, not favored by society, not necessarily the most educated. How on earth Do we see the king come back when the scripture says that it's connected to the gospel going everywhere? The only possible way we do that is if we're empowered by the spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? To preach the gospel to the unreached peoples. Why? So the king comes back. Why? We get to go home. It's all connected to me. I don't see any possible way to split out the gospel from eschatology. Amen. Yeah, Amen. that's that's good, Dick. Very encouraging. Um, you know, given given your experience there, um, tell me one of the things that pops into my mind. I'd love to hear if you have a few examples that come to mind of how you've seen um, this. An I don't know how to how to call it an emphasis on the day of the Lord related to the gospel or. Or how you've seen the the message of the gospel in terms, or as as it relates to the day of the Lord or the resurrection, how have you seen that bear fruit in the lives of disciples when eternal life is constantly in view in the message, whether it's to to Muslims or to other disciples on on live dead teams that you uh, that you work with. Well, there's a great book. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it. It's called Suffering Before Glory, at least part of the book. <laughs> there's a, a recommendation for you if you'd like to dig into what I'm about. A bit more. I said my own personal experience has not involved a lot of suffering. That is not true for everybody I work with on a daily basis. Living here in Saudi Arabia, everyone that's part of our house church now and that has come to the Lord has gone through a crucible, and they continue to do so. It's very, very difficult for them. Now, the Lord in his mercy has not, by his spirit, left them unprepared. So one of the gentlemen, I'll call him Samuel, uh, that's a part of our church. In his process of coming to the Lord, the Lord gave him a vision and a dream. And he related to me. He said, I know how I'm going to die. The Lord showed me. The Lord gave me a vision of this Arab man who snuck up behind me and slit my throat. And I know I have a vivid picture of it. The Lord showed me how to die. And he said, and I can't tell you how excited I am because the back part of that vision was a revelation of heaven and the presence of the Lord. And I can't wait to get there. And so he's unpacking this vision for me. And he's saying, I just can't believe how blessed I am (laughs) that when I am ill for the gospel, I have eternal life. And All my problems on this earth, you know, he's been rejected by his family. He's been kicked out of employment. He 
can't find a wife. He just lives as a outcast in his own society at all kinds of levels, gone through all kinds of drama. He's like, what idiot would want to stay down here in this mess? I get to go home. I get to go in the presence of the Lord. And he said, if I saw the person in my dream that was going to split my throat, I would run up to them and hug them. Because I say, you are doing me a favor. You're sending me on to my eternal life. No sin, no death, no suffering, no pain, no night. I want to thank you for sending me home. All right. That's not the reality of most Americans, right? We don't have dreams of the guy that's going to sit our throat. And we don't think I go up and hug him because he's going to take me by that act into the presence of the Lord forever with all the robustness of eternal life. So these realities facing rejection yesterday, another friend court case, he has received 400 lashes. His back is all messed up. He's been in prison multiple times because he has stood for Jesus. Yeah, try telling that guy the health and wealth gospel. Right. <laughs> try tell him that he'll never have any uh, problems in his life. And he is going back to prison most likely and facing all kinds of, he's got injuries. He limps around because of how he was me- maltreated when he was uh, under duress. But these guys, what they live in is the range. The simplest is completely being ostracized, rejected, yelled at. Um, And the worst, of course, is suffering, prison, and death. And yet, within that, there is great joy. And yesterday, there's a believer here. He started to share his faith with a brother, a literal brother. And the brother began to kind of castigate him, say, how can you pray to Jesus? And in the moment, he turned to his brother and said, dude, you pray to a black stone. Why are you worried about me praying to Jesus? And his brother was like, shoot, you're right. <laughs> I never thought about that. <laughs> and so now his brother's That's on awesome. this other trajectory, which is kind of neat that the Lord is using him. Also yesterday, another testimony. A radical Muslim had a dream. You know, in Ramadan, John referred to this. People get more edgy, but also they're more religiously involved. They pray more. And sometimes in that seeking, the Lord in his mercy reveals himself to them in a variety of ways. So yesterday, guy has a dream. It's a picture of Jesus on the cross, suffering. And it's a radical Muslim who had this dream. And Jesus says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then the vision rotates, and he turns on the cross, and he sees the back of Jesus. And on the back of Jesus is a telephone number. And then he wakes up. He's like, well, that's weird. He calls the telephone number. It is the number of a believer, a follower of Jesus. The believer says, what dream did you have? And he just begins to unpack the gospel to him, explains it clearly. And this radical Muslim can't believe what he's hearing. He's like, no, 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 it can't be. It's impossible. No. And hangs up on the believer because he was just so shocked at the gospel narrative. But you know what? The gospel's in his head now, the gospel's in his heart, and the Holy Spirit will come back and walk with this very radical Muslim, and we hope and pray, walk him right into the kingdom of God. So I'm straying from the question a little bit, but essentially here in context, suffering precedes glory. They have that hope and expectation of the kingdom of God, realize when Jesus comes, when the king comes back, they don't have any illusions that education or government protection or social programs or any of these other things will do any good for them. You know, it's a very wealthy country. That's not the answer either. They don't have any hope from solutions in this life. All of their expectation, all of their vision is on that day when the king comes back in glory. And because of that day, they can endure all kinds of hell here on earth. Their life on earth is not good. It's a suffering life, but they know glory is on the other side. And so for the joy set before them, they endure their cross, pressing on to that day of the Lord, which is, is it terrible? Is it great? Is it a day of judgment? Yes, for those who scorn the name of the Lord and will not bow and will not confess. But for my guys, it's the most awesome reality that you could ever imagine. Amen. That's just awesome. Hey man, that's that's encouraging, Dick. You know, what it, it I think it's gonna be very encouraging for our listeners because as you know, 
a lot of the context, you know, like in contrary, you know, in contrast to your context there where, where Jesus words in Matthew 16, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus. Those are redundant statements in a context right. like yours, right? Whereas here, they're very much take up your cross and follow Jesus are still very distinct statements, as you well know. And so I, I, I love I love some of those stories and, and just like to say to those who are listening, this is this is essentially why we spend thirty episodes going through, you know, the theology that we do is basically so that so that one day one of you could have this vision of having your throat slit and 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 count it all joy, you know that you might suffer for jesus sake and uh and inherit eternal life so i very encouraging and i and I know for a lot of our western listeners this is gonna this is gonna yeah. be very encouraging, yeah, really appreciate yeah. those well, and I guess my question, Dick, would be in light of some of these things that at least for us as westerners that would be really encouraging and, and even radical stories of these types of things that we don't see every day here in America. I interact with college students all the time that go, yeah, I'm just praying that I do well on my test and that I get the job that I want and that I can find the right wife that I, that I want and, and that I can have the white picket fence. And, and, you know, in light of that, I face challenges every day with students to encourage them to see the bigger picture, that their lives are a part of a bigger story, that the return of Jesus is their hope and is their focus. And, you know, these things seem more native to disciples who don't have the the typical nice Western context where everything's comfortable. So I can imagine that you do face challenges being there in the Middle East and and throughout the years. So what are some of those challenges that you have faced, specifically related to proclaiming the gospel and, and helping anchor disciples in this message of deny yourself, take up your cross, and look forward towards the return of Jesus? What are some of the challenges maybe that you face that, that you might be able to share with us? Let me start with one that maybe is a little unusual, and that would be the challenge to maintain zeal for God's house and passion for the lost. When you're in it day after day, month after month, year after year, you know, you start, get off that airplane nice and shiny, full of faith. And as the months and years go by, to maintain that life yielding passion for those who are lost can get trickier. And I've been going through a stage recently where it, you never divert from it theologically or even statistically, but the, the ethos and pathos of Feeling that burden and that urgency, it can wax and wane through the course of your missions career. So just last week, I was having a conversation with Jesus. I was like, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm not feeling it right now. I don't doubt the scriptures. You know, I haven't lost my commitment vision. I just don't feel an urgency for the loss. Sure. If I have a free evening, <laughs> I'd rather sit back and read a book than, you know, go out and shake the bushes one more time. And and I was having this conversation with the Lord. I said, I'm sorry, I just the feelings aren't there. The academics is there. The theology is there. But the the emotions not there, the passion. And in his sweet way, he's very sweet with us. He brought to mind that in my marriage relationship with my wife, there are some things that I'm just not really interested in, but she is. And because I love her, I get interested in them. And the thought came to me was like, Jesus, you know what? It's not really important to me right now. I don't feel the urgency, but I know it's important to you. And because I love you and because it's important to you, it's important to me. And I'm going to grind through this. I don't have the feelings right now. Don't have the, you know, spine tingling goosebumps down the back. But Jesus, I know this is supremely important to you. Your glory amongst all peoples forever. And because I love you, it's going to be important to me. So I would just say, you don't always have the bells ringing and the open heavens and all, you know, the spectacular emotional side of it. But if we love Jesus, we obey him. And if we love him, what's important to him is important to us, whether or not I'm feeling it in the moment. And so I would say that's one challenge for workers cross-culturally in difficult contexts. It's tough sledding, you know, and so sometimes just at the emotional level, which is harder to restore, I bounce back, John, I don't know about you, but I bounce back quicker spiritually and physically than I do emotionally. 
And when I'm yeah, emotionally sure. depleted, that's a long recovery process. Yeah, yes. And in those moments, mm. I just say, Lord, it's important to me because it's important to you. So I'm going to keep grinding. Yeah. You know, that's the old William Carey quote when he was asked the secret of his, his success. I can plot. So <laughs> I think sometimes you just grind it out. My one friend says we're rock biters. <laughs> we bite rocks until the rocks break. And it's a long, slow process. The other thing I would say is that now 29 years, I've seen a lot of people come and go. And the ones that make it, I don't know all the factors, but if I would boil it down to one factor to those who make it, to glorify Jesus and pressing towards that last day, not losing that blessed hope. They have settled it theologically that God is sovereign in all he does and all that he allows. And I say settle it theologically because if you only settle it experientially, which is the American problem, God is good because I'm healthy. God is good because I have a job. God is good because my students or my kids are well educated. God is good because he delivered me. That's experiential understanding of the goodness of God, which has a truth component. But what if that doesn't happen? All right. What if God doesn't deliver you? What if you're James, not Peter? What if you're sick and you die like Elisha did of a disease? You know, his bones raise people from the dead. He dies from a disease. What if you're that character in the story? You know, and so those that theologically have said, God, I believe you're good, sovereign in all that you do and all that you allow. They're unshakable. They can get raped. They can get thrown in prison. They can lose their visas. Their children can die. Multiple children can die. They can maybe not see physical fruit. Everybody can reject them, misunderstand them, but they're a rock because they've theologically determined God is sovereignly good in all that he does and all that he allows. So I would say a challenge then is if you don't have that theological conviction greater than an experiential understanding, you don't make it very long. Because I, I guarantee you, over here, things will go south. There'll be every range of frustration and disappointment from within and without. And so that bedrock of God's sovereign goodness is really foundational. And I would just challenge those or encourage those who are praying for those in the field or moving towards that. Settle it theologically. Stand on the promises. Let that be your reality. And linking it back, your emotions will come and go. Your passion will ebb and flow but it's not about you. It's about God, his sovereign power, his destiny, the written trajectory of scriptures, the faithfulness and power of the Holy Spirit. It's not about me. It's not about what I feel. It's not about what I experience. That's not what's consequential. It's about him. Yeah, that's awesome, Dick. It, it's true. You know, li life in the Middle East is uh, kind of life on adrenaline and uh, it, it's uh, pretty relentless. And so, there has to be faith that precedes uh, all else and uh, commitment to what you've given yourself to uh, to press through because otherwise it's just uh, it, there's a lot of stuff going on it can be pretty discouraging. But anyway, so kind of along those lines uh, to close up, you, you want to give us kind of two or three ways um, it, and Anybody who knows you and knows that uh, this is probably going to go along the lines of abiding, but uh, two, three ways that you would challenge and encourage our listeners to uh, stay the course in the gospel and the cross under the return of Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. You're right, John. It will start there. We build our lives on that promise in John 15 that apart from him, we can do nothing. And, you know, the Greek, it's a double negative. You can't do nothing. Um, but if we abide in him, well, we'll bear fruit. That's my promise. And so that concept of extended time in the presence of Jesus and the faith that he does the greater work and we have the lesser work, that he sings the melody and we kind of off tune chime in with our harmony, you know, that has sustained me and will sustain us. So it starts there, extended time in the presence of Jesus in the word and in prayer. And I don't just mean the status of abiding. Like, I also mean the dynamic walking with Jesus all day long. 
And that's the trickier part of abiding. You know, we're kind of like the Galatians. We start our day in the spirit and we end up in the flesh. And the more Zoom meetings we have and the more conversations we have, we end up whoop, migrating back to the flesh. So that is part of the crucified life, that you're not just uh, victorious in your morning abiding time. But what about all the rest of the day? And that whole take up your cross bit, John, I kind of resent some of our modern songs that you would bear my cross. Mm. Well, you know what? Jesus, he didn't bear my cross. <laughs> he bear, bore his. I understand what he's trying to say, <laughs> but I have to die daily. I really do. And I have to do that in the little things. And it has to be in my marriage. It has to be my parenting. It has to be my collegiate involvement. It really has to be setting aside what I want to do at any given moment for the Lord. So the the death to self experience is really not mystical and it's not dramatic. It's really practical and it's really insistent and it's really unceasing. And I think that's where most of us falter, especially if you're a guy and you like adventure and you want to be the hero. You're like, yeah, I was in the mosque in Medina, by the way, last week. It was really creepy. I prayed in tongues the whole time and then got out of there. But, you know, we're driven to that. Let's go prayer drive Mecca. Let's go where we're not allowed to go. Let's go down, you know, in flames. Well, I don't really think that's the, the bulk of it. Yeah. The bulk of it is, did I lay down my will for others today? Yeah. Did I walk in humility? Did I walk prayerfully? That email that I sent, did I do that in my own strength? Or did I look to Jesus to help me with that little minor decision? So I would say... Yes, that mystical communion at one level, but I would also say then that practical death to self, that abandon to your will on a consistent, non-glamorous, not getting any attention, can't write a newsletter about it in details. Yeah. What really makes us sweet even before others, and I think what gives us anointing and unction when we are gospelizing is if the hidden life that nobody can see and can't be reported on is genuine and dependent and Christocentric. Then if our pneumatology is Christocentric, when we are opening our mouths to proclaim, then the power of the spirit elevates the Christ in us and we're not really seen or noticed. So I think there's probably too much hubris left in me and in our general missionary force. We want to get credit. If I could end with one story, back in Sudan days, call in the middle of the night, uh, a 20 year old woman died, went and picked her up at the hospital. Her mom was crying, put her on this sisal bed. The mourners came out of the night. I felt the Lord tell me to lay hands on her, pray for her, that she'd be raised from the dead. I went over, I laid my hands on her. I said, in Jesus name, rise. And her body sat up and I was like, what? But, you know, it was just a fat lady had got off that sisal bed. So the bed shifted and the body jerked up and then fell back dead. She hadn't been changed, but I was embarrassed. So I left the place. I'm driving home in the middle of the night. I'm like, Jesus, I went out on a limb for you. I prayed this woman be raised from the dead. And now you look bad and I'm embarrassed. I don't get it. I trusted you and you didn't come through. And the, the sweet Holy Spirit just said to me, you know, in my heart, if she would have been raised from the dead, what would you have done? And I had to admit to myself and the Lord, I had boogied on home and written an email and told the story of how the Lord, quote, unquote, raised someone from the dead. But banking very sure the readers knew that I had a part in it, that I was the agent that the Lord used to bring this woman back from the dead. And then the Holy Spirit's conviction was simply this. Until I can trust you with my glory, I can't trust you with my power. And I was so sad that I wasn't a trustworthy ambassador, that maybe miracles and dramatic things for the Lord's glory were not released because of my hubris and my pride and my desire to get the byline. Sure, Jesus can have the headline. I want the byline. And that's got to get crucified out of us. And the daily life is what crucifies that out of us. The daily surrender that nobody can see gets us to a place where the Lord can use us as his vessel for all of his glory. And that's tougher. Yeah. That's a harder wow. walk. Wow. Dick, these stories and your words, I think uh, for me, there's so much to ponder and so much to meditate on and so much to to really chew on, especially as a disciple here in the West, um, from hearing from someone who has been living this way and is in a, in, in a context to 
truly, as your ministry is called, live dead. We hope that this podcast today bears fruit in the lives of especially Western disciples. Yes, disciples all around the world, but Western disciples to whom a lot of these things are very, very, very foreign. So, well, we really, really are grateful for you jumping on with us today, Dick. It's been a privilege to have you. Listeners, we hope you've been provoked and encouraged as well. Join us next time for another interview. Until then, thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless and Maranatha. 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 Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel. 